In the 1995 film Safe, starring Julianne Moore, a pampered housewife begins experiencing mysterious health issues that no one can diagnose. Set against the backdrop of material excess in the 1980s, her seemingly perfect life is marked by a lack of agency and personal fulfillment, leaving her feeling infantilized and powerless. As her imagined illness worsens, her psychological breakdown becomes a metaphor for her deep-seated emotional and existential crisis, exposing the hollow reality behind the suburban ideal and the devastating impact of a life dictated by societal expectations. Folks, what is the first thing that happens when somebody who has been missing for some time suddenly turns up? If you were thinking an interview, then you would be right. I can't wrap my head around the lack of curiosity of the British press to get an interview with Kate. But after analyzing the situation, I think I know why. The royal family is an inherently insular and incestuous institution. The entire concept of being royal is based on exclusion, meaning that the only true royals are the ones belonging to the royal family bloodline. There is the mythical idea of the blue-blooded royal, which refers to the belief that aristocrats and nobles have blue blood due to their superior lineage. This idea can be traced back to medieval Spain. The term blue blood was used by the Spanish nobility in the 9th century to distinguish themselves from the Moors who had darker skin. The Spanish nobles who were fair-skinned believed that their blue veins were more visible, symbolizing purity of blood. The concept later spread to other European countries, becoming a general term for nobility and aristocracy. The idea was rooted in the belief that nobility did not intermarry with the local population, maintaining their pure lineage. Thus, the myth of blue blood has origins that go back over a millennium, reflecting the social and racial hierarchies of that time. Now, up until the beginning of the 20th century, Inbreeding within the royal family was du jour, with the union of Queen Victoria and Prince Albert, who were first cousins. They started to figure out that it was probably not good for the gene pool to keep producing offspring with hereditary diseases such as hemophilia. But stubbornly, their solution was to simply marry other royals from other families across Europe. This served the purpose of maintaining exclusivity, which was and still remains the linchpin of the rigid British class system still in place today. And it also enabled them to form geopolitical alliances and to obtain more territory. They understand a lot better now, obviously, that it is healthier to produce offspring from a wider gene pool. However, paradoxically, it's still in conflict with the fundamental concept based on the eugenicist principle that in order to remain pure, one must keep it in the family as much as possible. And I think Kate felt very much like an outsider. I think she was reminded every day while she was there that she did not really belong, that she was not one of them. And I think it drove her crazy. We know now that Kate is alive, but folks, this girl is not playing ball anymore. I think she wants nothing more to do with this. Now they're back to claiming she's behind the scenes taking these comically photoshopped images. 
Now, if you remember early into this, when it was announced that she was in hospital, several journalists began making conjectures. Now, there were several theories being offered by these journalists. There was one claiming that Kate had donated a kidney. But there was another theory that went under the radar, and that was that Kate had suffered a nervous breakdown. And I think it's a very plausible theory that they broke her down psychologically, eroding her self-esteem down to nothing. And the physical evidence of that breakdown can be witnessed in her apparent eating disorder. Now, many of you may recall that Princess Diana admitted that she had an eating disorder. She admitted in several interviews that she was extremely depressed, especially after discovering the affair between her husband and Camilla, and that she had developed a full-blown eating disorder. So the first thing I thought when I saw Kate last Saturday was that she looked dangerously thin. Now, the difference between Kate and Diana is that unlike Diana, Kate is not very open. She has never been open about any issues she may be facing. Living up to the royal family's credo of never complain, never explain, she would rather go on about putting on a fake smile and pretending to the world that all is well than to admit that she is human and that she is not perfect. That she can be depressed just like anyone else. If you recall an earlier video where I talked about Kate's childhood experience at Downhouse School, where she was bullied for being too perfect. Well, nobody can be perfect, but I got to understand that what that meant was that she is willing to comply. That's the way they they like their women. Not opinionated, but compliant. You're never going to hear a word of criticism or complaint from Kate. Don't air your grievances. Don't tell anybody what you're going through. Don't let anyone know that you're depressed. And folks, this is the reason why the press infantilizes her. She is rewarded for internalizing her pain. We saw that when Harry decided to air his grievances in his book, what did they do? They turned against him. And I think Kate has always wanted to prove that she is a team player. I think Carol had a lot to do with this. It's always been Carol's grand plan to break through England's rigid class system by way of her daughters. I think that Party Pieces was never a very solvent company, and it was mainly used as a front to convey a false sense of wealth in order for the Middletons to be granted the privileges that come with said wealth. Now, I've gone over this before that prior to Kate's marriage into the royal family, Camilla did not approve of her. Camilla made her feel like trash. Camilla practically told her to her face that she was trash, made it known that she felt her parents were trash. And I don't think Camilla was the only one that alienated her. I think she was in a very hostile work environment for a long time. And if anyone has ever had a job that was just miserable to go to, where you had to face competition and backstabbing on a daily basis where you just can't wait for the day to end so you can go home and escape it, albeit temporarily, then you would understand. But for Kate, she never got to go home. The hostility was there for her 24-7. And what we witnessed on Saturday was someone that did not look comfortable. The papers tried to paint the picture of a loving family. What it looked like to me was that William made some snide remark to her because she immediately looks downcast and then puts on a fake smile just to kind of try to play it off. But the psychophantic British press will try to portray them as the perfect couple. 
And by refusing to speak, it may seem like she's not playing ball, but in fact, Kate is playing ball. Because as long as she's mute and not revealing anything negative about the royal family, then she will continue to receive positive press coverage. Diana revealed how she was being treated and she was pilloried for it. Press coverage turned from she's angelic to she's a problem. The same thing happened to Megan when she revealed that she felt suicidal. She was pilloried and branded a liar. What is very clear is that the British royal family does not have a very good reputation when it comes to how they treat women. And I think that Kate is fully aware that the minute she ever decides to lay bare to the world what she has endured, the press will turn against her. And I don't think that William was a very loving husband to begin with. And I think that Kate has had a miserable time throughout most of her marriage. She did not have any allies in that family except for one person. Harry. Harry was the only person in that family to show her some kindness. I think Harry was one of the few people in her life that made her laugh, and I think that he was someone she could confide in. Because if there's one thing about Harry, it's that Harry is not a snob. He does not care about what class you are from. And I think that's why she got along so well with Harry. And I think that once Harry left, she lost a big part of her emotional support within the family. And for this reason, I think there is a bit of resentment against Megan. If you remember those pictures of her at the Royal Variety, she was looking very thin from then and I think it was at this point that she and William probably had a huge fight about separating and she may have, as a result, suffered some kind of mental breakdown. But we're not going to know the answers because she's not giving any interviews. In fact, it seems she has gone back into hiding. And she knows that if she punctures the facade of the perfect marriage by speaking, she'll be seen as stepping out of line and they'll be ready to feed her to the wolves. Because folks, I'm not entirely convinced that she was a willing participant in the cancer narrative. I think it was mainly William's idea. William has a history of faking letters claiming to speak on other people's behalf. So this is entirely William's M.O. Now there is this piece by a Newsweek writer that popped up this week claiming that fans of Harry and Meghan are a danger. And folks, this is nothing more than the royal family's attempt to suppress dissent. During Diana's time, they were free to use their propaganda machine to malign her, to label her as a tart, a loose cannon, or as mentally unstable. But today, with the advent of the internet and the proliferation of social media, they are no longer able to get away with doing this without pushback from the public. The point is that they want to be able to get away with their lies and smears with no one asking any questions. This is just an attempt to chill free speech. Because make no mistake, by publishing this piece, the aim is to get the attention of the heads of these social media behemoths to suppress and eradicate any opinion that questions their narratives. Because let me tell you something, folks. The press doesn't care about Kate. All these fawning articles practically deifying her, they don't care about her at all. The press infantilizes her because she keeps her mouth shut. 
And as long as Kate remains silent, they will continue to use her as a prop for the royal family or as a cudgel against Harry and Meghan. And I don't know if she'll ever have the courage to speak. Kate has a lot of unresolved trauma, primarily because of the bullying she endured when she was a child because of her mother's insistence on sending her off to some highfalutin school where she was made to feel like an outsider. And Kate has always been the kind of person to internalize her feelings. She once exclaimed that therapy isn't for everyone. Because, folks, the complicit British press isn't interested in getting an interview from Kate because she might end up spilling the beans about the appalling treatment she has endured in the royal family. Because I just find it a little hard to believe that nobody is interested in hearing her story. Where were you for the last six months? What happened? Tell us about your cancer treatment. Folks, they don't want her talking because they are protecting William and the family. And as long as she remains silent, you're going to continue to see these articles treating her as if she's some kind of a saint. But make no mistake, folks, the marriage is done. Now, here's what I think lies at the heart of all this secrecy. Her title. When Charles passes, William becomes king. And there are certain people who do not want Kate to have the title of queen. Think about it. Camilla, who insisted on being curtsy to, and which Kate refused, will now have to curtsy to Kate And I think Camilla would rather die than to have to curtsy to Kate. And I don't think William wants her to have the title either, but pride prevents him from announcing to the world that his marriage is a failure. But what if her title has already been stripped? It has not gone unnoticed that many in the press have reverted to referring to her not as Princess of Wales or even just Catherine, but simply the common Kate Middleton, much to the dismay and outright anger of her fans. Could it be that in these secretive negotiations, she has already been stripped of her title, and the public is the last to know.